We talk a lot about spiritual gifts, but one thing we don't talk a lot about is what is the purpose of spiritual gifts? In the Bible, we hear this term spiritual gifts, and there are some named spiritual gifts, though we should really not take the named spiritual gifts as an exhaustive list, meaning that all the gifts that are named that we see in the Bible, those are the only gifts that God has for us. Because the word that's used for spiritual gifts isn't really the word spiritual gift, it's the word pneumatikon, which means spiritual things or of the spirit. And the point of that, the reason why that's important is because it's how the spirit moves in us, the Holy Spirit, what he does, and he gifts us according to his own will. Whatever it is that he wants us to do, he will provide us. He will indwell us and give us the ability to do what he wants us to do. And we need to remember, and this is the point of this video, to answer the question, the point, the purpose of these, this gifting, the point of him moving in us. Now, recall back in John 15, Jesus is getting ready to leave. He's getting ready to depart. His death is at hand, and he's speaking to his disciples, and he's wanting them to know a few things. One, importantly, that they won't be by themselves and that the Holy Spirit will come. Now, why is this important? Well, principally because when Jesus was there with them, he would give them power or authority for the moment to do certain things. Now, he's going to give them, specifically them, more power going forward, but this also some of these things, some of the things that he's going to give them it's also going to relate to us. One of the things that's going to happen for all believers as the Holy Spirit comes in is us testifying of him. In John 15, 26, he says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify about me. Now, he's not going to testify about the Holy Spirit about himself. He's not going to speak about uh, you being able to do things or how much power you have or what you can get as a result of tapping into the Holy Spirit. No, he says you are going to testify of me. And we know that's the case. So when Jesus says to the disciples in Acts 1, he says that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then what? Be my witnesses. The same word that's used in John 15 of testify. That is what the disciples and not just the disciples, but also all of us who have the Holy Spirit. The identifying mark of every Christian is the Holy Spirit. Whoever is led by the Spirit, those are the sons of God. And so without the Spirit, you're not a son of God. If you are a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit. Now, the problem comes in when we naturally as human beings, we want to do great things. We want to be great. We want to be special. But that can also be a problem. We want to be something special. Oftentimes, it ends up showing up as us wanting to be more than what we really are. Paul actually addresses this in Romans 12. He says in verse three, he says, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allowed to each a measure of faith. Now notice as he's going to go into these issues of certain spiritual giftings, he says not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to, which is important to make sure that we are humble in our thoughts, sober-minded. Now look what he says next. He says in verse 4, just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. A couple things. One, we're going to see this whole thought that we see in Romans 12 show up also in 1 Corinthians 12. The same person Paul is speaking and he says that our goal is to benefit, even he says so here, is for one another. Continuing, look at what he says in verse six. He says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, which means the gifts are differing according to however God desires to give it, to grant it. We see that also being mentioned by Paul in first Corinthians. But continuing, he says, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who show, shows mercy with cheerfulness. Something that you should be able to see is that these gifts are not inward acting, but they're outward. They're being exercised outward on others. Now, he, he's going to say so 
even more explicit. The Bible's going to say so more explicitly that these gifts are for others. And that's the whole point. The purpose of every spiritual gift is not for you to grow you, to benefit you, or even to edify you. It is to edify others. Paul goes on to make this point even more so. Look in verse 9. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Look what he says. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. In other words, what we should not do is have an inward focus. It should be an outward focus on others. Now, when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to see what he means in terms of how these gifts, how this move of the Spirit, these pneumaticon, these spiritual things are for others. He says in verse 1 of chapter 12, now concerning spiritual gifts, and the word that's used here is the Greek word pneumaticon, which means spiritual things. He says, I do not want you to be unaware or some of your versions may be ignorant. In other words, I don't want you to do certain things spiritually ignorantly. I don't want you to concerning these spiritual gifts or spiritual things. I don't want you to be ignorant, unknowing. Now in verse four, he goes on to speak about this unity. And even as it relates to us towards one another, look what he says. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministry and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Here it is. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. This is for the benefit of all. So Paul is saying that the spiritual gifts, this, this gifting is for the benefit of the common good to manifest for others. And we, if we keep reading, we'll see Paul talk about how there's no portion of the body that is more uh, noble or deserving more honor than the next. We shouldn't desire certain gifts above other gifts and so forth. But everything that we should do, every gifting should be done and coupled in under the umbrella of love, which is why we have this whole chapter in chapter 13 that is speaking about love. No matter what we do, whatever we do, if we don't do it with love, then it is vain. It is of no use. Now, when I said earlier that every spiritual gift is for the edification of others and not for yourself, there's a passage in, in chapter 14 that comes up that people think that this proves that spiritual gifts, particularly tongues, is for the edification of self. That is not what that is. Paul is writing this letter of rebuke. Paul is not accommodating. Paul is not patting anyone on the back, stating how good they've been in any portion of the letter. Even when we get to chapter 12, 13, and 14, he's not saying how great they are. He is writing because he doesn't want us to be ignorant of anything spiritual. In this case, he happens to bring up a couple of gifts. Specifically here, he brings up tongues. And he says, this misuse that you guys are doing, you're not doing it out of love. And all you're doing is edifying yourself. In verse 2, he says, for one who speaks in a tongue, this is a singular, ec ecstatic unknown tongue that no one has no idea what he said, not even the speaker, he says, does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Verse 4, dropping down, he says, the one who speaks in, in a tongue, the same tongue that no one knows, this mystery, he says all he's doing, he edifies himself, but the one who prophesies, the one who gives the prophetuete, the, the proclamation, uh, the foretelling or the fourth telling that particular person brings a revelation of God and the entire church is edified principally because that the, the language that is given is in the language of the persons, the people that are hearing it. And so they understand it and they get growth from it. They're built up from this as well. Now, to make the point that no spiritual gift, including tongues, is to edify yourself, it becomes a problem if we take that you can't edify yourself with tongues if we look at every other passage that has to do with edification, and it's always in regards to edifying others. As a matter of fact, it is specifically told that we should edify the body, not ourselves. In verse 5, he says that, Now I wish that you all spoke in these tongues of these languages, which is what the word means, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies, brings about these revelations, than the one who speaks in a language, unless he interprets. Why? So that the church may receive edification. So again, we see that the point, the purpose of this gift is to edify the body. Paul is dealing with this issue of understanding so that everyone will know, including the speaker, the hearers, the audience would know what's happening. They want them to be ignorant. And then look what he says in verse 12 regarding 
even a flute or an instrument being used, he says, let's start in verse 11, he says, if I then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, look what he says, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Again, the second time that we see in chapter 12, I mean chapter 14, that, the, that we should edify the body, edify the church. Dropping down in verse 17, again, no one knows what's being said. Verse 17 says, for you are giving thanks well enough. You, it, it's, it's, it's presumable that what you're doing is giving God thanks, though you don't know what you're saying. He says, but the other person is not edified. He dropped down in verse 19, says, however, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Paul's point is that the other people can also receive benefit, not you. Verse 26, Paul says that let all things be done uh, decently in order. Everyone wants to come in, in the assembly. Each one has a psalms. Each one has a teaching. Each one has revelation, has a tongue, has interpretation. Look what he says. Let all things be done for edification. There it is again. The point of these spiritual gifts are to edify, not you, but the body. Now, this issue with this this unknown tongue, this ecstatic tongue, where no one knows what you're saying, he says, don't do that. As a matter of fact, even if you're going to speak in an actual known language, there should be interpretation for the entire body so that the entire body can understand so that you know what you, what's being said, the person that's being spoken to knows what's being said, and the entire body is being understood what's happening. And as we look down in verse 31, for you can all prophesy, and that just simply means to give a revelation by God one by one so that all may learn and be exhorted. To further make this point, we'll see some other readings by Paul, but also from some others. Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, he says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such as a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Again, the point is that others be edified by what we do, by what we say. A move of the Spirit is not for you, but for the entirety of the body. Romans 15, 2, Paul also says, Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. So again, our, our goal is to edify the body not just be selfish and to edify ourselves. That happens a lot. Again, that's why Paul says not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. But then it's not just Paul. It's also Peter. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, starting in verse 8, he says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sin. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Here it is. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so if you have a gift, we all do, uh, given to us by the Holy Spirit, use it in serving one another. And so all of these passages end up speaking of us edifying one another, not edifying ourselves. Now, there is another passage that people may tend to turn to to say, no, Corey, there is another passage that says that we should edify ourselves. But when we look at the passage, we'll see that this passage is not telling anybody, any believer, to edify himself. Thus far, we have not seen one passage that tells us to edify ourselves, meaning there's no passage that says the spiritual gifts are for ourselves, but for others. Even if someone wants to disagree and says that, say that the passage in 1 Corinthians 14 states that we should edify ourselves, I'm saying it doesn't, especially when you compare it with other passages, then we would have a contradiction. And if you want to go to Jude 20, that passage also states that we should edify others rather than edifying ourselves. So in Jude 20, he says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Look what he says, though. He says, But you, this word here for you the, in the Greek, this is not the singular you. This is the plural you. So he's saying that you all, all of you, when he says all of you, beloved, building yourselves up, and this word here for yourselves in the Greek, this is also the plural. So he says that you all build up one another, be, build up you all, you all build up all of you. And so the whole point of this is that it's not to build yourself up, it's to build up others. That is the point. It's really just what Jesus did. We don't have an example of a man of God, be it a prophet, be it an apostle, 
any servant, true servant, or Jesus himself, using their gift, their abilities for their benefit. But it is always used or exercised for the benefit of others, which is what Paul said. The manifestation of the spirit is for the common good of others. And so Paul says, if since you're so zealous for these spiritual things, desire to build up the body, the edification of the church. So my friends, I hope this has been helpful. It should be clear. Any spiritual gift, whatever it is, whatever spiritual gift that you think that you have, it is to be used with or towards targeting others, edifying others, not yourself. I think if we had that as our first thought, if we had that as our priority, if we knew that, then the abuses that we see out here with people uh, misusing or giving these fake imposter gifts, so to speak, we wouldn't see that if we judged those gifts or the people as to whether they are doing these things for others or for themselves. That would cut down, I think, on a lot of the misunderstanding and the foolishness that we see sometimes that have kind of crept into the church that the Bible says is going to happen. If we knew exactly what spiritual gifts were for, then we would hold others accountable. But now we do. Now we know, according to the scriptures, that spiritual gifts are not for our own edification, but for the edification of others. Amen.